Welcome, I'm Michael Pierce for The Human Condition. Today we're talking about our brainwave series, where we're talking about brainwave collection and what it means for both, um, somewhat for both doctors and patients. There are some doctors and technicians who are learning to collect brainwave data, and there are patients who want to learn about brainwave data. So imagine that your doctor has told you that you need brainwave uh, studies, or your psychologist has told you it'd be a good idea to look at your brainwaves, or you've been studying on your own and you've found that there are some really neat science behind brainwave collection. And you think, boy, I'd really like to see what my brainwaves look like. So to introduce you to brainwaves, we really need to talk about the, the types of brainwaves that are measured. And, and really the first ones are resting brainwaves versus active brainwaves. So in resting brain waves, whatever machine is measuring you, uh, whatever instrument is measuring you, you are doing essentially nothing. You are either lying down or sitting. You are um, having your eyes closed or eyes open in a resting position, trying to really do nothing. You're not, you're not actively doing anything. You're not intensely praying. You're not meditating. You're not doing mathematics in your head. You're not thinking about politics or whatever. You, you have to kind of have a placid brain for these resting states. Um, in the active states, you may be doing something. You may, you may have a task. The task is often reading, or it is watching a tablet-driven um, application where you're asked questions and you're answering questions, or you're, you're sorting things. You may be given some kind of task where you're, you're asked to listen or watch and discern between one type of stimulus and another type of stimulus. So those are the two general ideas. By far, um, most of the kind of work you'll see in, in clinics today is resting. And then you'll see another really common active one called the P300, or an event-related potential, which is having to do with an event. So an event happens and your brain responds. And within a few milliseconds, a few hundred milliseconds, we have a whole curve that we can look at that shows how your brain responded and if it responded the way it's supposed to. If it responded in a very healthy way, or if it responded too fast or too slow, or with too little oomph or too much oomph, which we would call a voltage or microvoltage. And so that's the general idea. Now, these um, event-related potentials are something that you see less commonly, but they're, they're, also, they're also around in, in quite a number of growing, growing number of machines. So an EEG is where we measure brain waves. And in the, in the days when, when I was in school, um, you know, in, in uh, graduate school over 25 years ago, we actually had paper. And so the, there would be ink pens hooked up to, um, to the computers and to paper. And the, um, um, the paper would roll by and the ink would, would move and, and trace lines on the paper. So if we wanted to read an EEG or an EKG in, in graduate school or, or undergrad, we had to unroll a long, long sheet of paper and, and read the, the person's data. Today, we have them recorded on computers, of course, and they, they scroll by on a, on a, on a screen that, that virtually rolls by as if it's a roll of paper. So, um, so essentially, we're looking at squiggly lines that represent the brain's function. So now, we have to kind of break down, what are we really measuring? So every nerve cell in your brain has many, many different arms, like tentacles that go out from it, over 10,000 arms that go out from it and, and, and come into it and give it information and allow it to send information out. So um, in some ways, it's simultaneously sending out low frequency signals and high frequency signals and medium frequency signals and low frequency signals all around the place. So if the question is asked, um, are individual nerve cells generating more than one frequency at a time? The answer is yeah, they are, because they have different arms that are doing different things. It's much like a piano player who has a hand doing this and a hand doing this. And so as this hand does this and this hand does this, they're doing different things. So one individual can create two different frequencies. However, when we do EEG measurements, we're not measuring one neuron. We're measuring a bunch of neurons and summating all of them together. So it's almost, it's almost as if we're up in a high balcony listening to thousands of neurons, nerve cells, down below in the courtyard or the patio, and we hear a thousand voices chanting and we're trying to figure out what are they saying. And, and the aggregate of what they're saying is that message. So we don't pick up individual neurons unless we, unless we do single neuron um, implants inside the brain, which we can do with little needles, but we don't do that in clinical science. We do that in laboratory science. So when you get your brain measured, we're not going into your brain we're just picking up signals that are coming out and we're, we're gathering the aggregate of thousands and thousands of cells 
that are all thrumming along at the same general frequency, and we're picking up all those different layers of frequencies and pulling them apart using mathematics and computers and algorithms to create a picture of what the voices are in your brain calling out. And that, that picture of the voices calling out will tell us whether your brain is uh, overactive in a certain area or underactive in a certain area, or uh, overactive in a lower frequency, which is a little strange, and we'll get to that, or underactive in a high frequency, which seems a little bit counterintuitive, but we'll get to those explanations. So the general idea is what we want to do is we want to correlate a symptom with an anatomical region and a brain wave and a voltage and an amplitude, and we want to say, hey, there's a region of your brain that is firing at a certain frequency that's dominant, a certain frequency, a certain wavelength, and its power is too much or too little, and it's confined to a certain region or it's spread out over a region, and it correlates with your symptoms. It fits with what we would expect with the symptoms you have. So we can either correlate or anti-correlate with what your symptoms are. And most of the time, if you do a good job, they seem to correlate and, um, um, and the, data, the data fits. Sometimes it doesn't, and then that helps us as doctors and figure out that the patient maybe has something else wrong. And it doesn't mean that the patient is necessarily lying to us. It simply means most of the time that um, um, there's another factor going on that might be explaining it. There may be some other brain area that we don't see with brain waves. Brain waves mostly see the top of the brain called the cortex. Uh, brain wave imagers don't see the brain stem. They don't see the mesencephalon, pons, and medulla, which are the brain stem. They do not see the cerebellum. So you don't get that uh, understanding of what those parts of the brain are doing. And you also can't really see the basal ganglia, which are structures that are deep inside the cortex. And if you, if you look at somebody's brain, these structures deep inside are called the basal ganglia. And those are responsible for a lot of emotional and um, obsessive kinds of thoughts, and they're responsible for, um, they, they contribute to all kinds of repetitive and ruminative thoughts. So these are areas that are called, for those of you that care, the caudate, the putamen, the globus pallidus internus and externus, and the subthalamic nucleus. These are different areas, the claustrum. These are, these are areas of the brain that are um, kind of automatic systems that fire loops and, and, and help us, but sometimes they help us too much. And so they fire automatically either too much or too little. And we call those the direct and indirect pathways for those of you that are interested in that. So we can't see those cells because the only kind of cells that the brainwave uh, machines will pick up in EEG and QEG are the giant pyramidal cells of Betts. These are giant cells. And, and when there's a synapse where one cell meets another cell and there's, a, there's a, 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 a signal that goes across that gap, which is called a neurotransmitter. And most of you know what those neurotransmitters are. Things like dopamine and serotonin and all kinds of different um, GABA, different neurotransmitters. Once they go across, there's something called a excitatory postsynaptic potential. And that means the electrical wave that happens after the synapse. So we, we, pick, we pick up the excitatory postsynaptic potential after the synapse from these giant pyramidal cells of Betts. And those are the ones that are big enough for us to pick up an electrical signal from and aggregate a bunch of them and say, ah, we see brain waves. But there are many types of cytoarchitectural or, or structural or uh, anatomical cells that are smaller and different, and we can't pick up those brain waves very well. And those much more um, evolutionarily or uh, embryologically older, phylogenetically older types of cells are smaller and, and architecturally different. They, they're not the same size and shape and they don't create robust electrical signals for us to pick up. So that's why the, um, the brain waves are usually uh, picking up the biggest part of the brain that we know well called the cerebrum, which is the lobes of the brain, the frontal lobes, the parietal lobes, the temporal lobes, and the occipital lobes, and some sub, um, uh, subcortical structures and the limbic system can also be picked up. So if we were to take the brain apart like this and, and look at the lobes of the, uh, the hemispheres of the brain, there is kind of a cliff uh, on each hemisphere like this with a space between for some veins. And that, that area, if we were to turn the brain like this, that, that cliff face contains a lot of the structures that are part of our limbic system or our emotional system. Those, are, those we can pick up with EEG because those have giant pyramidal cells and those postsynaptic potential after the synapse we can pick up. And those are the areas that control <clears throat> our emotions. Those are areas that control our endocrine system, our hormones. Those areas control uh, our immune system. So it's fascinating, and there's quite a difference between the right and the left side. The right and left side of these deep limbic structures work together with the cerebellum, which we cannot see on EEG, to regulate our immune system and to, and to ramp up our immune system or turn down our immune system. And that's very important in autoimmune disease when we look at functional neurology and how functional neurology can help 
patients control and regulate their immune system and get it back under control without drugs or with drugs sometimes. So in any case, uh, the difference between EEG and ERP is EEG is passive. It's usually a person not doing anything. And ERP is usually active where a person is clicking a mouse or pressing a space bar on a, on a keyboard. They're doing something in response to a stimulus. And so we need to explain the difference between correlation and, uh, and causation. As we talked about earlier, we're looking at correlation or association of, of brainwave phenomena and symptoms. Um, that a person may have and correlating that with neurological findings of things like uh, asymmetries of their facial movements, asymmetries of their autonomic nervous system, asymmetries of their sensory or motor system or their extra pyramidal system we call that, which is kind of the unconscious coordination of the body. And then um, one of the difficulties of this is we cannot always prove causation. We cannot always prove in, in say a court situation that this caused that or this came before that. But we can get very, very close with, uh, with correlation. So um, while we can't always prove causation, we can usually show and demonstrate correlation and association, and we can infer some causation. We can act as, as if by creating a theory for the patient, which is our, our clinical hypothesis, our clinical theory, which is a testable idea that says, Mrs. Jones, I think your problem happened here and it became this problem of your brainwave and that created the symptom. And if we, if we try to go back and correct this brainwave, if we're correct, then correcting that brainwave, if it was causative, would then correct your symptom. And so that's a testable hypothesis, which makes it clinical science. Now, it isn't perfect science because it doesn't satisfy the causation rule. However, as a clinician, I'm not so concerned about establishing causation for every patient because that's not my job. I have a moral imperative and an ethic to serve that patient, not to establish scientific truth for all humanity. That's not my job, because my patient is going to suffer and die before science figures out what's actually true in a provable, rock-solid way. So uh, that is chapter one, the uh, introduction to EEG and ERP.